reading of God's Word. John chapter 1. <clears throat> the title of the message is Experience. Continuing this series. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you'd anoint the reading of the Word and the preaching of the Word. We need more of your Spirit. Father, please send your Holy Spirit with power. Lord, anoint our ears, our very souls to hear, our hearts and minds to hear what it is you're saying to us today. Father, I ask you to bathe each of us in your spirit. Lord, lower the walls. Come against doubt. Bless us. We thank you in Jesus. Amen. Verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John the Baptist. <clears throat> the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I met when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. <clears throat> I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. You should go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> Believe it or not, you have much to share with others about Jesus. Some of us in this room don't really think we do, but we do. Then there are two particular things we can declare what we know or believe to be true about him, and we can share and relate our experiences with him. But before we get into that, I want to touch on something. Dave Reaver, uh, an evangelist across the nation, he was a Vietnam vet, was disfigured when a napalm grenade, I think it was, went off. We saw him at General Counsel, and I'm getting emails from his organization. He said, I don't know the source, and some of you have heard the story. He said, I don't know the source, but I heard a story about the atheist who debated with God about the origin of man. The atheist insisted adamantly that he could create man. God said to him, really, go ahead, create a man if you can. The atheist happily took up the challenge from God. Kneeling down to begin his task, he started scooping dirt together to create a man. Oh, no, you don't, said God. You have to get your own dirt. He, he goes on to say, When we feel we are losing the battle to God-rejecting atheistic professors in our colleges, I would, in universities, I would admit, throughout society, or add, this, add those, and humanistic organization, organizations that are empowered by billionaire sponsorships, just remember this all-important fact. Before there was an atheist, before there was a debate about the origin of man, God created the heavens and the earth, and we were created in his image. Many of us feel intimidated. We are a little fearful of sharing our testimony, sharing with Jesus because of what other people might say. Amen? And particularly if we know that they're, they're intellectual or they're bright, we are particularly intimidated. You could go to Brian and Annette's class for some help with apologetics. Go to life groups to grow. Coming to worship service is a good first step, but you need to go to life groups to continue to grow. But folks, you don't need to be fearful of sharing with anyone. Remember that you and I don't save. We share our testimony. We can share more, but at the very least, we can share our testimony, which can be very powerful in the hands of God and the Holy Spirit. So let us talk. This first point is declaration. You can declare to others like John the Baptist did. John the Baptist in verse 29 says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, right? Who saves all, the Savior of all. That's his testimony. He's declaring that Jesus is the Savior. You and I should be declaring and can declare what we know to be true with conviction. What is it you and I should be able to declare? If you have 
confess Jesus as your Lord. If you've made Him your, your Lord and you've surrendered and you found Him to be your Savior, you should have conviction. What's that conviction look like? Well, each of us should be able to say, I know the guilt that I've had. I know what I was guilty of. I know that I lied. I know that I was trying to make myself God because I was measuring other people by my standards of what right and wrong are. I know that I lusted. I know that I did all these things. And for each of us, there are some similarities and some differences. But there should not only be conviction that, yes, I was guilty, but I called out to Jesus and I know He heard me. We need to have that conviction. Wouldn't you agree? I, I was praying through this and the title of the message is Experience and we're actually going to get to that portion next week. I'm actually only going to give you the first step, first point this week because last night the Lord identified for me, I've been wrestling with Him, why this first point? This week it just seems so simple, it seems so basic. Why camp out here? And, and then last night He began to show me why we have to camp out here today. Next week we'll go to what I really wanted to preach today. We don't all have conviction that He's Savior. We don't all sitting here have conviction that He's Savior. John the Baptist, he had conviction. And when he was baptizing, notice in the passage we read last week, they said to him, the Pharisees came and said, Why are you baptizing? You don't have authority to baptize. You shouldn't be baptizing Jews. Who are you? You're not, the, you're not Elijah. You're not the Messiah. You're not the Christ. You're not the prophet. Who are you? He did not answer them, but he answers them this week. It's the next day, and he says, this is the reason I baptize. I baptize so that the Messiah, the Christ, can be revealed to all Israel. See, God had a purpose in the water baptism. And there were a couple of purposes. One, so that the way would be made level for the Lord to preach, but also that Jesus would be revealed. How many of us, if we have conviction and we're serving the Lord, we should be able to say, I'm doing this so that Jesus can be revealed to you. If we give clothing away from there, we should be able to say, you know, I'm doing this so that Jesus, so you know the love of Jesus. I'm doing it because Jesus loves you. I'm not so good about that all the time myself. If we help somebody with a flat tire, we should be able to say to them because of our conviction you know, I, I'm grateful for this opportunity to help you because Jesus loves you. It's an opportunity because it's an opportunity for Jesus to reveal himself to them. What can conviction look like? Uh, W.A. Criswell is a famous old preacher. Don't know a lot about him. He told the story, and I, I take it that he is the pastor involved. There was a pastor who was preaching to the open air. And there were a lot of people on the lawn. And he heard this voice when he quieted down. There was a voice from the top floor of the jail. And the voice said, Hey, Pastor, would you pray for me? I killed a man and I need God's forgiveness. So W.A. Criswell says that he got down on one knee and he prayed. And when he got done, and he asked everybody to be quiet. When he got done, he got off his knee and the, the fellow in the jail cried out and said, Thank you. I really needed his forgiveness. A year later, the governor, I believe his name was Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, of Oklahoma, got a petition. There was a fellow who was sent away for probably life in prison, which was run by a very hard warden. He got a petition that had been signed by the warden and from the prison guards requesting that this one particular prisoner be granted amnesty, be released from prison. The governor couldn't believe it, so he went and he talked with the inmate, and the inmate said, look, I heard this pastor preaching a year ago, and he said that Jesus loves us and died for us and will forgive our sins. He said, I'd never heard that before. And so when I prayed, I knew I was forgiven. And because I knew I was forgiven, I also knew that I was given a new chance. 
And it was because he had such conviction, he was so transformed that the warden himself and the prison guards themselves asked the governor to let him out. And the governor said, though it's against all the rules, I'm going to do it. But that's what conviction will do. Can you imagine what he told people when he got out of prison? It was, he was testifying everywhere. But why is it? Some of us, we don't have that conviction because we haven't really repented. Some of us don't have that conviction that we're forgiven, that he's really Savior, because we're half in and half out. We've heard that he's the Lord. We've heard that he's Savior. He'll fix our lives. And so we called on his name. But you know what? Without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so if we say, well, it's okay if I drink myself into a blind's eye, or if I'm cruel to my spouse, or if I'm cruel to my children, or if I look at things that are lust, you know, if I look at pornography, if I gamble, if I do these things and I hide it and I lie to my spouse about it, I take these things from work, nobody else, and we justify ourselves, we will not enter the kingdom of God. And folks, until we get to the place where we totally surrender, we will not have that conviction that He is Savior. And so when you try to tell someone He's Savior, have, you know, and you put everything into it, folks, God could use you, but He also used a donkey. But don't expect a lot of fruit. Right? There's another reason why some of us don't have conviction. That survey that I asked you to do last week, how many of you have started asking people the survey questions? I saying, I have one question for you. How many of you have done it? Got to tell you, I have had the best week that I've had in, I think, months. It was, it was a wonderful week. Started Monday, I went to the jail. Had somebody I wanted to go in and see. I'm going in to see him every couple of weeks. On my way in, you know, you go through this one locked door, and then there's this glass, and there's a guard in there, and he's the one that controls two doors, actually three doors in that little room. And they come and they wand you. There's somebody who comes in, meets you there, and wands you, you empty your pockets. And, you know, the guards are always pretty lighthearted at that. Most of them are pretty lighthearted at that point. As a clergy, so they'll say, well, do you have a bazooka in your pocket? You know, guns, chains, knives, or anything. It's like, I've pulled out my keys. I leave my wallet out in the car. You know, you don't wear coats, and you just empty your pockets. And they're fun. This woman guard met me there, and she wanted me. And she said, how are you doing today? I said, good. And how are you doing? She was transparent in an instant. She said, do you ever have a day where you get up, and from the time you get up, it's just heavy? And she went on for a minute, and I said, well, I was kind of, because I was ready for all that banter. It's like, yeah. So they were taking me to a visitor uh, the visiting room, usually I get to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one, but They put me in the visitor room that you go to on Tuesdays and Saturdays. It's hard for me to hear. But... So they opened, They were getting ready to open the store. I don't know. I guess they did open the door. And before I went through, I said, can I pray with you? Keep in mind that there's this guard on the other side of that glass who's controlling the doors. And there's a little window there, and he can hear and see everything that's going on. And she looked at me for a second, and she said, yes. That's cool. I went in, I met with the prisoner, I said, I have a, you know, we talk, and, you know, he doesn't know Jesus. So I witnessed to him. Told him my testimony. I practiced my, I asked you to practice, I ran it by him. And I said, you think about it. But I said, I have a question for you. I'm going to give you three statements, and I want, I'd like you to tell me which one speaks to you. You matter, you're loved, he breaks chains. He said, well, what's each one mean? I said, I, I don't want to explain it to you, just which one speaks to you. So he, said, he told me which one spoke to him, and I took note of it. I, that day, I hit the hospital, I hit Baker Miller, I hit the police department, I hit the nursing home, talked to the J.M. Murray folks. I was asking people left and right. I've got to tell you, it was fun. If you will ask people that question, when you tell them it's a survey, they, they'll answer it. It's only one question. Most people... They'll answer it. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, the first two, 
You matter in your love, they're in a dead heat. And I found it doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter age. I had two people around the same age, ask them, it's 50% either way. There are people that I talked with this last week, they have masks on. Every week I go in and I see them. Get gas, I do this. They have masks. They're the same all the time. I can't crack their veneer no matter what I do. I talk about the weather, you talk about this, I threw a track at one. They're just, you know, business. Walls, Jericho walls all around them. But I'll tell you, I asked that survey question, the mask went down. People are taking that question very seriously. And whether they answer your love through you matter, i got to tell you that you see in their face the emotion attached with their answer. They don't have to say anything. You can see it etched on their face. There's a, I talked with two women at the same time over at Cortland Hospital. I went in to say, you know, is there anybody from Groton AG over you know, in the hospital? I knew that I was going in to see Larry. And uh, I don't think there was anybody else at that point. And so the older lady, she said, I love all three statements. She's a Christian. I've talked with her before. She's training a young woman who's between us now. So I said, I didn't even say, you know, I just asked both of them at the same time. Young lady, you could see on her face, she said, you matter. I think she told me twice, so I wouldn't miss it. But you could see. There's, there's something under it. There's some hurt under it. Folks, you will be amazed. If you'll just ask people, you don't have to know who they are. You'll be amazed. I only had one person who was grumpy. He was, I won't even say where he was. It was a fellow. And he was, what is the survey for? But he, he answered it. So I went off and got what I wanted out of his store and kept moving and went back and shoved it in front of the next person. But only one. You know, and he wasn't bad. He said, what's that for? It shows me that we're heading in the right direction. That these statements are going to touch people. The problem is that there are people sitting here who feel that you don't matter and you don't feel loved. Until last night, I didn't know why God included this first point. Declaring with conviction that He's Savior. You see, if we don't feel we matter... And we don't feel we're loved by God, and we're asking those questions, there's a, there's a place in us where faith is not pure. We haven't been able to let him in completely because we don't trust. God does healing in time, but if we're, if we're saying, I don't feel like I matter, we don't understand what Jesus did. We don't understand it. You haven't fully embraced who you are as a child of God. If you feel like you're not loved and you can't even, you're having difficulty receiving God's love, folks, that's an indication. There's more of Jesus for you. With the you matter, John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, Jesus said, You seek the praise of men. Folks, as long as we're trying to figure out that we matter, you know, and we base it on people's reactions to us or what we're doing, you're always going to fall short. You're always going to fall short. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes is a book about vanity of vanities. You know, one of the wealthiest people who ever lived, he was the wisest man who ever lived, he goes through our lives and he says, it's vanity. Work as hard as you can, it's vanity. Be a good parent, it's vanity. Now I added that, but everything he talks about is vanity. Because we die. There's injustice in the world. Just because you're a good person, you're a good parent, doesn't mean that your life is going to be sweet and things are going to go well. And you know what? We all go to the same hole in the ground. Whether you're burned up or you're blown into the air, doesn't matter. We all die. We all part from this body. Even at the rapture, think of this. These bodies can't enter the kingdom of God. Even at the rapture, these bodies get transformed. Everything's vanity. And his closing is this.
Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. As long as you base your sense of self-worth, self-worth, based upon other people, or what it is you do, or recognition you get, or position you hold, you will be seeking and chasing after the air. You will never be satisfied. It's like the heroin addict can't stop taking heroin. The alcoholic can't stop taking alcohol. You have to get to the place. John 3.16. Galatians 2.20. Write down Galatians 2.20. Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Your value and the fact that you matter is not based in anything anyone around you does for you or doesn't do for you or any positions you hold or any work you do. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You matter because God created you. You matter and have value because the only perfect person in the world, God, came down in the form of a man. He paid the penalty that you could never pay. He took your place because He loves you. And He gave you His Spirit and He gave you life. And He did it because you matter. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to know anybody else. You matter because you are His child. You have to fight that feeling, I don't matter. Every time that thought comes to you, say, I do matter because Jesus, Galatians 2.20, He loves me. He died for me. He raised me from the dead with Himself. You matter because of what He did for you on the cross and what He did on Resurrection Sunday. Please, you've got to fight that fight in your brain. I heard a... I turned on the radio this morning while I was shaving. About the only time I hear the news some mornings, and it was... I expected FLN, and it was NPR. And it was a Buddhist. Shaman. A lot of gobbledygook, but I'll say this. He got one thing right. What you think directs how you go. Truth is truth, no matter who says it. When you feel like you don't matter, and when you feel like you're not loved, challenge that. Your thoughts follow your feelings. Aren't you tired of feeling like you don't matter. Aren't you tired of always trying to feel like you matter? Aren't you tired of not feeling loved? How are you going to be able to tell somebody, yeah, you matter, when you don't feel like you matter? How are you going to be able to tell somebody, yeah, you're loved, he loves you, when you don't have that conviction? How can you say Jesus is my Savior when you doubt his love for you or it hasn't transformed your life to the point where you can say, you know what, I matter because I am. And now I'm free to serve in whatever way He gives me. Did you hear that? I matter because He loves me. It's my relationship with Him. He loves me and I matter. A twofer. And now it gives me liberty to serve Him and care for others. And now I'm not dependent on your, your loving me to feel like I matter. I matter. I hope you love me. But my dependence, my my self-image isn't dependent on you. And so now I'm not going to manipulate you and manipulate situations to try to control you to be like me. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to ask the tough question. This came to me last night. I said, okay, Lord, today we camp out on conviction. This morning, you know, I was praying, Lord, I don't want to do this if it's you. I'm cutting my sermon right in half. Next week we'll do part two. I don't want to do this in you unless you're in it. You ever have those conversations with God? You've got to show me. I want proof. Right? I want proof, buddy. God. <laughs> I want proof. This morning in my prayer, you know, and it's the way he talks. I had the sense. Like light opening up. And it's like, this, there are people here who need to be set free from pursuing feeling like you matter and seeing it in God, from feeling like you're not loved and questioning that, to seeing the fact that you are loved. It's not a feeling. 
Believe what He tells you. And the feelings will come. This is the hard part for you. First service, I, I breathed fire and brimstone. Same sermon, they got it with both barrels. They seem to. I don't know if it's because I'm hot out of the gate or what. <clears throat> you folks get the gentler version. <laughs> Are you willing to stand up today and say, I am one of those who struggles to feel that I matter? Will you stand up and say, I'm one of those who struggles to feel loved? Will you trust me? Will you trust God? We'll have you come up here. We'll have people gather around you and anoint you with oil and pray for you. Will you do that? First service sent six people, and there were people I knew that needed to. Six people rose up, and some of the ones I thought should be there were still sitting down. It's like, okay. The others weren't where they needed to be. You know, God, it's a process. God needs to bring them along to the place where they can trust Him. If you're here this morning, will you stand and say, I acknowledge it, and I want freedom? Would you do that now, please? If you are struggling, feel that you matter, or that you're loved, would you stand?